Moniz. I'm based here in Houston, Texas, and I am a Microsoft AI MVP. Um, my background is data warehousing and analytics, and I'm delighted to be able to, to leverage that even further um, by utilizing the, the AI Cognitive Services Suite. So I enjoy sharing information about Cognitive Services as well as talking about extending frameworks to the cloud. Thank you. Sounds very interesting. But it's not you who's going to speak today. Uh, <laughs> we have two guests a today. very new guest today. Hi and welcome, Hi, Alicia. And, uh, Mia, sorry. <laughs> Hi. Hi, Mia. How are you doing? Hello. Yeah, I think it's like quite wonderful weather today in Berlin. So everything's good. Great. That's nice yeah. weather. So here it's awesome weather. Nice to sit outside. <laughs> here to learn a little bit. Yeah. Mia, just Introduce yourself. Who are you? Um, hello, everyone. I'm Mia. Um, I'm currently work as a data scientist in Berlin. Um, I'm also an AI MVP for three years. Um, later on, I will share some topics about how uh, in our team, like how we deliver our uh, project and then also about how this goes. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Well, we're delighted to have you with us today, Mia. And I, I see that you also um, have a focus on model development and model management and yeah. have extensive experience in NLP and conversational AI. So yeah. I, I know that's a passion of yours. And I also see that you're very involved in the community. Um, you help organized the Azure Meetup Berlin, the yeah. TensorFlow user group in Berlin, the, and also help coordinate the Our Ladies Taipei and the Azure Taiwan Meetups. So yeah. um, thank you for everything you do for the community. Yeah, cool. <laughs> <laughs> so what are you going to talk about today, Mia? Um, I guess like today's uh, the talk will be about like uh, steps to put your model to production. So I suppose there are some people who work as a software engineer might want to work toward to data scientist position. They would like to know more about how the project look like. And there are also some people might work as a DevOps and then they are so new to work with a data science uh, application. So that I think uh, this talk will help uh, both uh, software engineer side and also DevOps people could know more about the data science project. Okay, cool. Yeah. For the live viewers, uh, we have our chat on YouTube. Uh, please yeah. use it if you have any questions for Mia. Um, it can be during the during her talk. Um, Mia, can we interrupt you if there's any questions? Yeah, I think so. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> and otherwise, it will be afterwards during the Q and A. So, Mia, I'm yeah. uh, just going to give you the platform, and here you go. Yeah. Okay. So, hi everyone. Today, that starts the sessions today. Um, so, this is a bit about myself. That, as you could see, like as I mentioned, work as a data scientist in Achilles. And uh, last year, I published a book with other 16 MVPs across the world. Uh, it's called the Microsoft AI MVP book. You can find it already on the Amazon Kindle. And this year, I also co-authored um, another book with Alicia, uh, which you just saw her. And then uh, this book, we uh, co-authored also with other three MVPs. So we definitely enjoyed the time there. Um, so, okay. Um, so this book we will probably uh, publish later this year on Manning. So if you stay tuned on Manning Publisher website, you might see our book coming up later this year. And also during the session, if you have any question, feel free to send your questions uh, on the, the YouTube comment or uh, after the session, you could connect me on LinkedIn or Twitter. So let's start today's session. So actually for me, I quite, uh, for me, like the data science project, usually we go through this four big phrases, would be con 
uh, content like pre-processed the data, uh, put in the model, and then put on the cloud and to talk about the maintenance. So actually, like today, I'm going to talk about when you get the data, how you would know the data is okay with uh, working or is it still have some space to improve? And after that, after you check the quality of the data, uh, you could see like how this work with a uh, reproducible process. That means if you uh, work around with your code, but later on you still have to refactor it to make your code clean and also people could readable to maintain this. And also later on, let's talk about when you talk about the mo model. Uh, when we got the model, it's not only run on your comp computer, but also we would like to publish it as a RESTful service that people could reach it to RESTful code. And uh, also later on, we'd like to talk about how to dockerize the, your service, put on the cloud, and also some experience that we use in our project to help uh, to have it more like health check, more stable, and then make the the service uh, decompose it a bit so that when there's a more uh, complex process for the model prediction, we could uh, make it a better architect on it. So today's data set, actually, I would like to introduce Iris. Um, as you could see here, Iris is a kind of like flower. And in the picture here, you could see there are three subcategory of the Iris flowers. And then you could see there are different kinds of the flower from the color wise and also from the different size of it. So usually when you describe a flower or when you describe an object, that the data would be looked like this. Um, so the data will look like with the numbers and also with uh, different categories that you want to categorize them. So as most of the case, if you've got a data set which is uh, pre-processed, which is prepared, and you will see the data is always like balanced, and also uh, there's not much like missing value and you could work with it quite easily. So if here, I would like to introduce you a tools called Pandas Profiling. Um, so after you run the Pandas Profiling against your data, you will get a report like uh, like this is a HTML report that you could easily bring it up uh, to your data provider, for example, could be your client or could be your colleagues that you could bring it up to them to talk about, hey, um, why this columns has a lot of missing value? Why this columns has unbalanced data uh, compared to the other one? And um, if this is like an ideal data set, usually you could work with it easily. So as you could see in the screen, um, if you find um, a word called like missing or missing percentage, you will find like a zero entry of the data has missing value. That means all the data in this data set is quite clear that you could use it. And if you want to see the, the real world, and uh, this one is the one that I run against uh, one of the data set I currently work on, um, you could see on your left hand side, the number of variables will be 27. That means this table with 27 features. And then the observations is like the raw data, uh, how many data that I work with. So you can find uh, the missing cells are 21% of it. And even some of them are like duplicate rows. So you could see basically in the real world, there are a lot of uh, the data, which is like in a mass, uh, could be like miss a lot of data, could be like um, duplicate with other rows, or people write it unclear, or people write it with typoed, etc. Um, one of the examples that you could see here in the warnings, um, you could find a column, it's called has elevator. And this color you could see like 94% are missing value. So apparently this column is not your good friend when you work with the models. Um, so in this case, you would see on your right hand side, you will show for each of the columns, you will show some status like um, if this missing value a lot comes, if it should reject this column and if you should work with it or if it's a school data, let's say. Um, so here 
I would like to show you also um, on more detailed level, you could see for each of the columns. So you could see us like visualized each column of it. So if some of you already work with Azure Machine Learning, you might also feel like quite familiar with this kind of uh, visualization of your data set. I would say it's quite important when you work with the data set, you have the first feeling what uh, column you should start with or what you should start working with it. So let me uh, click and then to see uh, to a small demo on it. Um, in this repository, I actually shared on the, the GitHub. So then later on, you could uh, go to the GitHub repository to clone this uh, sample code, and you might have to pl play around with it a bit. Um, so let's see from here. Uh, first, you could see from the portfolio. From the portfolio here, you could see actually what I did is I import a CSV data, which is called IRS. And um, another one would be I would like to generate a report and the report name is look like this. So if you go to the with how I wrote uh, the run profiling, it's just look like this. You initiate the profile report objects and then later on you store that as like this. So if I run it with uh, for polyl, so basically you will see something like the progress bar. Um, you could see like how it goes to correlation, calculation, interaction, tables, missing value, and some warnings. Um, later on, you will see like the data, the report will be generated in our folders here. And unfortunately, I could not read the HTML by my eyes. That's checked like here. So after um, we see the report here, like you will see there's a navigation bar on your right hand side, you could actually send this HTML uh, to your colleagues, no matter it's like a business owner or your data providers, because it was just showing like how's the data feelings, how do you like this data set. So um, in this one, I would recommend you to run against it with it. And another case I would share you is the one that I run with my own data set, the one that I just mentioned earlier, that as you could see, um, this report will provide you some of the information how you could run the things um, easily, and then you could have a first feeling of your data set. So, okay, let's go back to our slides. So the next one I would like to share you is about uh, refactoring your code on Jupyter Notebook. Um, I would say this part is kind of important because like I think most of you have the experience with Jupyter Notebook already. Um, you could rather uh, install one on your computer or you could write it on the Azure Notebook that uh, you could uh, program your code in each of the small blocks or you could call code cells and then you could run it individually and you could run in on per, not particular order. You could run like one, two, three, four, five, or one, three, five, two, and still works. So this cause like it's easy to for people to just like have the feelings, have just the trial, but after what after you got the real model that you actually need to make your code clean and reproducible. Otherwise that people won't know like how you get to the model. So actually there's a st study from um, UC San Diego. Um, there's a lab that they scrapped uh, a million Jupyter notebooks on the GitHub. And then they found like how people program their Jupyter notebook. Um, as you could see here, the Jupyter notebook contains like from one to a hundred uh, cells of the code. That means like several blocks of that. And the lines of the code are from one lines to a thousand lines and um, only 25% of it uh, wrote properly with the description. And here you could even see like the percentage of all the notebooks, um, only 
33% of it uh, writes the program with functions and only 12% of it program with the classes. So you could know like people actually program it quite randomly and then they don't really follow like um, all, all things to design their code and operation their code. So I would say the second step for that after you get to know your data, after you work on data pre-processing, after you get it, please refactor your code so it happens like this like if there's a guy who works in your data science team or if there's a girl like me work in the data science team and then they always look like they're thinking of something and then you you work up to them i say hey how's everything goes i saw you update a model and can i check the notebook and then the next would be like oh it's like uh you heard the longest ohm that you ever had it's like they feel so embarrassed to share the code that they just program on the notebook because it's just like a mess on it. So like whenever there's a new colleagues comes, when there is a code review, or even like myself, I check out my code after two weeks, like when I'm vacation. So always feel like, oh, why my code look like this? I should do more cleaning. So here I would like to provide you some tips that I usually would use uh, during my project. Um, okay, so then this one I would like to show you um, so actually I put all my steps on the github so I basically just go back and forth on the, the commits that I met before so that uh, you could easily could just check it out and follow the steps um so here actually you could see if i run a notebook there's a notebook that i prepared usually is a typical notebook uh look like a bit mess compared to other uh scripts for the python script one so you could see like in the Jupyter notebook people always like it just run around what they really like sometimes they will run one to print it out um, the data frames or the, the plots and sometimes they were just tried it out to print in some of the list and then after that they just code like the models and then train them so as you could see like in the whole notebook you could not see any classes or the methods and then it's kind of like a typical notebook that um, a data scientist will work with so after that as you see a notebook like this you might want to uh, remind your colleagues that it would be nice if you could put something together as a method and then later on we could write test code against it and then also it's easier to maintain uh, the code so let's um, go back to the studio code here Um, so here I would like to share um, one of the tools that I mentioned earlier would be like the type hint. Um, a type hint is one of the pre-built functions in Python since 3.5. Um, so that means what you could do is that you could easily check uh, your code uh, with the statistic one. So that's say if we just want to write a um, really simple method code at I want to write the at function and then return me this value so that's assume that for each of the values that I want to run will be a, like an integer not a string so I would write something like one and two and then write against it So it's like three. And if you write something like one plus string two, um, you will still get something like, okay, um, this one. It would shows, oh, you got a type error because you put uh, one as integer and then you want to use add operator against the string. So it would shows when you run the code with it. But actually we could uh, have it a bit earlier. 
that when you click here and your function and then actually you could uh, run uh, test your code before you really start to run in it um, so let's say if you run um, my pay with this uh, type type hint that you will see before you really start to run this one it's already did a status static check for your code so that it will shows hey i want to add one and another one is a string but i just it as an integer so that actually if you change it as like second here and then you could run against with it again to check your code it works good and then you run the python with it then you will make sure your code always runs. So then I would suggest you to try it out the type in to maintain your code, to mention about what would be like expected input and what would be the expected output so that when you program your code and then your colleague could understand your code easily because sometimes when you do data processing, like the input and output, then you will forgot what's the things being um, pre-processed and or be data handling during the time. So uh, you will probably want to know more about the details, what is the type of expected input and what is expected output of your code. Okay, so um, not only this one, I would like to share you another one will be say so um, this one will be one of the things that I want to share since we already sold a notebook uh, with unclear one and then you might want to refactor your code like this um, every process uh, you should process as like a different function and then mention about what's the input type and then the output type and later on people could easily will know what should be uh, put in the input and output and the code would be easier to maintain with some test code against with it so i think that's the the second one that i want to mention so actually let's say let's suppose you already finished the model training and the next one is you would like to use a service like to serve your code. For example, in this case, you will see after you program on your Visual Studio or Visual Studio code, you might want to wrap it up with a Flask app. And then the Flask app after you committed it, and then we could connect to the uh, Azure web application. So you could actually deploy there. After you deploy that, actually, I would suggest it as like a really good service that you could work with. Um, so as you could see, one of the case, you could work as a chatbot. So um, I could share one of my experience. So last year, I went to a hackathon. It's called a voice chatbot. So basically for me, like I integrate a voice assistant that I just make a backend of it. And then I have the backend of it and then I link on the Azure service. So after that, during the hackathon, you are able to deliver your product as a real online website, not only runs on your computer and which is like really rough also during the hackathon because most of the time people will just work around with it. So if you are able to deliver your product or your model on the cloud, it's like you already stand in front of most of the people. So um, I would definitely suggest you if you haven't had have the experience, use Flask or Fast API. Please spend some of your time and then try to make um, your model work with learn with the Flask so that you can serve as a rest of our service. Um, so later on, I would like to quick check on my code. Um, again. Um, later on, I have one prepared. Mm -hmm. Okay, so when you see the app, 
application here. So actually you could see I have um, a web application. I have two endpoints. Um, one is I got the model from uh, the pickle files here. Um, so I have one hash check hello world endpoint. And another endpoint I will work with iris data. So I assume that um, actually you already got your model with uh, circular model or that Sakara's model, or TensorFlow model, and later on you could just easily uh, spin on your service by Flask app. So actually, uh, when you run the Flask app, that you could easily run up with this script. Then um, you will see the service is on right here. You will see the hello world. And if you want to test that out with some different functions, I have one here. So if you have some request numbers uh, with different set of input that you could test it out with your endpoint. So that means you could basically run a rest of our service on your computer. But as I mentioned, that's not enough. It's only run on your computer. We could also try it out with um, a Docker REST environment. Let's see here. Let's stop this one. Um, so I prepared a Docker file here. As you could see, I want to wrap it out all my web applications or rest of our applications. Um, so what I did is I start with the Python environment and then I copy my order code here to the Docker environment. And then later on, I said, please run the Python AP app to Py so that um, the model could be run in the Dockerized environment. So let's say if I build one, um, image okay so um, during the time is building the docker image let's see if there's some ask questions or some comments no not yet okay so um, as you could see so usually i will suggest you how to structure your project like usually people will just put everything as they want in the project but as you could see in the left hand side i will strongly suggest you to put all the data that you work on no matter it's like the raw data process the data model or the report that i just mentioned html files and um, this data later on you could move um, together so for example uh, originally you commit to your code base but the optimal solution would be you work with a uh, data version control you publish your data with a version code so that later on when you put uh, your code you will know which files and which version of these files that you have worked on with the models so that it's easily for you to work on with that and um, after the data, usually you could run some test case along with it and then some utilities that you could run. So the utilities, I would suggest you to wrap it up also with um, some functions that you could easily test on later. Um, so let's see if the Docker is prepared. Okay, Docker run. Yeah, we do have one question Yeah. Uh, related to the Flask framework. Yes. Uh, so question is, is the Flask framework a good choice to deploy a model with millions of requests? Okay, so I think this is a good uh, question. So basically for the, the Flask app, uh, once you you get a request and then you would get one request at the time. So it would be better if you work a, a synchronized way, you have another queue after you got a request and then you uh, send this request as like a small job to your backend. So your backend could uh, co-work with it. And so I think uh, the Flask app is 
like I would say it's a really quick solution. But later on, I would mention about how you could scale up your application. One of the example would be um, so far we binded the model with the Flask app together. But later on, you could see um, if you decompose the service, you could consider the Flask app as a gateway. And then later on, you serve each of the model as like a separate service. So you could just imagine that the gateway just get the request, but later on the request will be sending over a synchronized to other models process. So then it's easier to work with a bunch of requests on it. Yeah. And um, I hope I answered the, the question on it for the, the stream one. Okay. Yes, thank you, Mia. That was great. Okay, so let's go back to, to the Dockerized here. So if we want Dockerized run with the port, um, so actually it would show that you will get a local host model, which should run uh, a similar one, uh, similar behavior as we expect before. So if I get um, the parameters here, let's say if we change to some inputs, you will get some prediction on it. So basically what I want to test out here is basically uh, to tell you like when you finish develop your model, you're not only handling a pickle file to your backend or your DevOps colleagues, you also have to take responsibilities that to wrap it up your service as like a dockerized one so that people could easily work with that and also easily to deploy that. So after we got the dockerized one, uh, let's go back to the slides. As you could see, like after we dockerized your app, then actually you are able to uh, put your service, no matter it's like on a cloud or on your client uh, computer or no matter it is. And then the next one is actually deploy your web applications. So I assume uh, some of you already have the experience work with the web applications. Um, Actually, like, I don't know, maybe some of you already work with it, and then some people may not know this function, which I really loved it, um, because after you create a web application, you could find Deployment Center, and then once you click that, uh, you could choose which code base that you're working on. And in today's uh, case, I work with the GitHub, and then later on, you could see just from like a three or four clicks that you're able to deploy your service. So let's go to the, the portal here. So if I want to create a resource web application, and then I created one of it, um, that's called it, um, I use an old uh, resource group. It's called Iris AI Docking. Okay, and then um, what I runtime stack will be Python, right, uh, Python 3.7, and then the region will be West uh, Europe, uh, since I'm in Berlin. Um, so here is almost the thing that I want to set it up and review create this resource. Create. Just remember that until you click the create and then you should see something on your right hand side saying like deployment is in progress um, because sometimes I will forgot to cr create uh, click the create button so I like keep waiting like nothing but um, please make sure you click the create button and then make sure your deployment is on the way so let's go to the service let's go to the service Iris AI talking. Here we got a new service here. As I mentioned, we go to deployment center and then I go to click with the GitHub, uh, one of the repository. Um, GitHub continue. And then I take the first one because later on you will see it's kind of easy to just set it up with just click and then select my repository and then the branch. 
then you are able to go. So actually, you find is like um, even though you don't have the experience work on with deployment or shifting your code to the cloud, but still it's really easy to just set up um, the code and then uh, deploy it on it. And then in this um, page, actually you could easily could see you could refresh it, and then to get uh, the status, for example. Um, it's pending right now, and then you could check the logs as like you check the, the steps or progressing, like how the things goes on. Um, so let's say I'm not sure like how long it takes for deployment. Usually it would be like within five minutes, but just in case I have plenty of web service that I already deployed it as earlier. Um, so as you could see, like there's another uh, website that I prepared earlier. Um, it will look like this. Once you like uh, deployed, it will actually work the same as you work on the local side or Dockerized side as you saw. And then um, so it's like the hollow word for the sample one. And then if we have uh, one point for iris um oh i got this from iris ai talk azure web site net let's go okay cool so um basically once you deploy your service you are able to test it out just on the fly and then even you could already send this URL to your friends, say, hey, I actually published an AI mod on the cloud right now, test on your computer. So I would say it's like really awesome things that I um, usually that I will work with because for example, um, when people ask machine learning project to start with, they usually want to have the feelings about how the service look like. Um, so it's also really convenient if you know how to make a POC or like quick demo for you what you're working on and what your model look like, then people would have the quick feeling about how the old things work. Okay, so let's assume the other one. Let's go back to see the previous one that's already done. Da -da. Hmm. Yeah, so there's one thing I would like to mention here. So after you clicked it, and one thing you need to configure would be configuration here. And then you have to go to the general setting. There's a really important stuff called start up comments. Because you remember when we uh, wrote a Docker uh, image, we mentioned about there's a Python app, the Py. So Python free or Python. So you have to store it. So just uh, to remember that the startup comments. So that means when your um, file has been uh, moved on the cloud uh, place, you need a start entry comments to run start your application just like you run on your computer. So you need to tell that uh, what's the startup comments. And then once you, um, I need to store it, save, yeah, already refreshed it, continue. So I will just make sure again that I already stored my startup comments here and um, for this um, logs, I would like to redeploy that so that uh, you were deployed with the startup comments that I request. Okay, so during the time that I deployed, I would like to go through more details about what um, would be the setups. Um, so as you see, um, your service has been uh, published as an Azure app service. So it's also really convenient if you also install this package uh, extension on your Visual Studio code that you could just easily to click and check manage your web service in your Visual Studio code, like right hand side here. 
And another thing would be dashboard. So if you are familiar with uh, Application Insight, you could feel free to connect your web service with Application Insight. But also uh, in our project, we connect with Grafana. Um, as you could see, this one of the screenshot I screenshot during the weekend. So you would see there's no one requested the service, but you still could have the feelings about um, during the past one month, there are some service quite healthy up for 30 days. And there are some of them maybe we still tested, we still developed it. So it's not so stable, like 40% uptime or 75% uptime, for example. Um, so I would definitely suggest you after you deploy the service, you try to find a way to monitor your service to see if it's healthy. And then once it has some arrows or had some things that, uh, for example, as people ask questions earlier, if your service got DDoS or got hacked, uh, you will got instantly got notified. And um, one of the thing I would suggest would be the testing your code is super, super important because most of code for the data science project, as I mentioned, be written in the Joker notebook, which is not easy to be tested. Um, so once you refactor your code, um, try to rearrange your method and code to the Python script, it's easier to maintain, to collaborate together. And then also once you publish online, you could also test out with the endpoint setting. Mm. The final one would be the composite for the <clears throat> the products. So um, as I mentioned earlier in this um, sample, we actually binding the model with the web application together. But uh, there are some cases you might want to provide more than one models for your service. And in your model that you might need some really um, aggregate data. So for example, if you've got streaming data, you might want to aggregate as like 15 minutes as a time window, then later on you send to you the prediction. So you might need some aggregation, you might need some cleaning during the time you do the processing. So actually after this one, I would strongly suggest sit down together with uh, people who work with a more system level, uh, backend engineer or DevOps engineer, they will definitely help you to make your service more stable. Uh, one of the example will be since I copy my binary file for my model on the GitHub repository, which is not an ideal way. So actually I should store my model on the Azure blob storage. And during I used Azure pipelines that I could reach on my blob storage download my model, which is more secure. And during the time, if I need to reach my other uh, service, I could go with the um, service connection or I could store some secret connection st string or information on the keyboard. And also I could put my Docker image on the container registry so that actually you will see the previous steps that we already got through. It's kind of like the baby steps. But uh, later on, after you bring this all together, then you actually have something prepared that you could easily uh, bring it up to backend engineers, bring up to the DevOps people, say, hey, I have these things, I have this product, I need your help to shifting on the cloud. So you could do the composition of your service, uh, bring it up with the Azure pipelines. So if you store something on your local repository, please bring it on uh, as a um, separate place on the, the blob storage or container registry, as I mentioned. And the next one, you could see there's a sample as what we use in the project. So on your left hand side, you will see actually if we want to deliver a service, we actually want two steps. One is build our uh, image and then push on the container registry. And then the second one will be deploy our model on the, the cloud. So when we deploy the model on the cloud, we we'll be actually we go to the key vault to get some secrets where uh, to store our sensitive information. And then we use uh, Helm to help us install some packages that we need to use. And then later on, we pull the images and then deploy our service on the Kubernetes cluster. So before you really want to do this complicated things, make sure you already prepare everything as I mentioned earlier. So when you communicate, when you collaborate, you will make things more easier.
Mm. Another thing is, so uh, one of the service that I use also a lot would be Seldom Core. Um, in this service, actually, you are able to scale up your model. If you actually bring a lot of model in your backend, you have model A, maybe B, model C, you might want to scale up one of it because due to the high request, so you would like to uh, have it like more uh, flexible or security one to secure your model. And uh, another case will be not only one model you want to serve as like uh, three replica, but also it's also possible that you have a really long process to pre-process your data, to uh, make a time aggregation your data, clean your data, and then put into model and then prediction and comes back. So if you have a really long term um, prediction process, that you also want to decompose it with uh, from your web service so that you could separate it as one service only take a request and other service will take uh, your request and then handling what data process and then predict and then send your result back. So this will be the things I would strongly suggest after you find your service is stable enough with just one model, try to decompose your service and then try to make a small component so that they could work together quite good. Um, so I think that's all for the things that I want to deliver today. Let's make a short recap on it. Uh, first, we went through the data quality. We generate a fancy report. If you want to complain your data provider, you have something that you could mention into. Um, the second one I mentioned about refactoring is super important, especially in data centers to code. Please try to do it. And after we run the algorithms, we get the model, then try to serve it as a service that people could use it, uh, people could reach out. And later on, if you uh, want to quick test out your model, try to use Azure Web application, especially the deployment center is uh, your good friend to test out your model. And the last one, as I mentioned, would be maintenance on your service, would be health check, make a dashboard, and also decompose uh, your service. So I think that's all the things that I want to deliver today. So if you want to know more, please feel free to search these keywords like data sampling, move your model to the blob storage, make it more secure, uh, play around CICD with the Azure DevOps pipeline and authentication, etc. So I think that's it. So is there any questions? Um, feel free to write down the YouTube comments or... Um, well, we still had a, a question, Mia. Yes. Um, so if you're asking, when mm -hmm. deploying a Docker image as a web service using web app in Azure, does mm -hmm. web app handle the scalability of our service based on the number of requests? Mm -hmm. So if you set up a web app, um, I would suggest you like um, the web application is like only one service. So it's basically you could just test it out for how is your data work, how's your model work. But once since you know your request will come up a lot of like stream data, uh, really high volumes of requests, I would strongly recommend you to use Kubernetes to set it up because uh, Kubernetes could help you to set up for each of the, the service that you use once it uh, reached 80% of its like CPU or um, its memory, it would automatically scale out as another service. So I would say the first um, idea would be just put it out on the, the internet, but the later on, once you know you have the higher uh, request, please uh, sit down together with your like system um, maintenance designer or like DevOps people, they will definitely provide you a better way to structure your service. Okay. And cool. Also, Alicia, do you have any questions for Mia? Yeah, I actually did have <laughs> have a question. And, okay. Uh, so 
You talk about seven steps, and I I know a lot of people start off with just the notebook and the code. Yeah. So so which of the other um, six steps is is the easiest to to kind of get people started into CI/CD and started into um, productionalization of their code, um, and because you know software matures and you know people start at one place and then they migrate yeah. over to to maybe they'll bring a, a devops guy on the team or yeah, a devops girl on the team <laughs> and so so what have you seen as far as the the maturation of yeah kind of the the dev team and the dev processes and yeah. what steps like in what order do you see the steps progressing yeah so um i think like alicia mentioned a really good question would be if someone just start with job with notebook so um if you just start with job with notebook maybe you uh just start to program or just start knowing what is machine learning, what is algorithm is. So then for you, the first things that you want to achieve will be make your code run. And then that's the first things, but that's not a level that people could bring it up together the code and discuss. Because for example, you know how your algorithm works as like a service, but from the backend or from DevOps people, they actually don't understand Python. They actually don't know uh, how you process your data like this. So um, I would suggest the next step would be the step, the second one, as I mentioned, try to refactoring your code and try to use type hint in your Python code because that would definitely help um, you to understand your code a bit more better in like object of oriented way. So when people read your code, like uh, when other people try to help you to maintain this from a system level, and then they would able to understand, oh, this function that actually run in with this, um, like uh, how this run with this process. And then people could actually more understandable what you are doing at the moment, because I also found uh, it's really important, like um, from data science people, you want to reach out the system part, like, but we actually don't know much about the DevOps. And from the other hand would be DevOps people really want to help us, like really want to help data science team, but they, they don't know what the service look like. So let's say the first step, if you want to co-work together, you make your code more clean. So people, if they want to help you work together, it's more easier. And the second one is when you uh, publish your model as a web service, as I demoed earlier, then people would have the first feelings about, oh, is, if your model been deployed, it would work like this as rest of our service. So then later on, actually, from the DevOps people, they have a lot of experience work with rest of our service, work with backend. So then they will know how to protect your endpoint with proper authentication setup, and also they know how to help you to set up uh, if there's a high volume account of uh, request. So then uh, from the data science team, actually you don't need to know much about the system level, but you still need to prepare your service as like a prepared box. And then later on people could bring your box and then deliver it to a more high scale level of the product. So I would say that's how uh, I try to make this uh, sessions also fit for both the data scientist and also for the backend uh, DevOps people. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. If you would compare Flask, well, mm -hmm. let's say uh, Azure Machine Learning versus Flask. Mm -hmm. um, how would you compare it with each other? So um, I would say the. Um, if you want to use Azure Machine Learning, the, the GUI one, and then you could click and publish it as like a web service. So you would get an endpoint. So for example, you get an endpoint, then you could request an, an iris, the data, and then to there. So it's kind of like the model itself as a service. So if you use uh, Flask, then you could do some aggregation before you really reach the, the model. So for example, like mm -hmm. if you uh, send me both flower information and cars information as together in like one request, 
and then I could pre-process it as like the flower information go to the iris model, the car information I go to maybe object detection model, etc. So you, if you use Flask, then you able to control like what you want to do pre-process it and then go to the Azure ML model. So yes, you still could use the Azure uh, ML model as your backend, but before you still need a service to help you pre-process the data that you got. Because you could imagine like if you are uh, implement a chatbot, like your chatbot, you, you won't input a message like Iris flower one, two, three, four. You will, you will input like, hey, I got this flower and then you take a picture and then your service got like the lawn and then the white of the flowers and then you send this information to your model so then you need still need some preprocess before that so i think that's how i use the, the flask app in the service yeah okay so the difference is that with flask you have a way bigger uh Flexibility. Uh, flexibility. Yeah. Yes, definitely. And also, I forgot to mention after you got the prediction, also you have the flexibility to aggregate the result of it. Because sometimes you might want to aggregate three or four models results and then alone uh, follow your business logic and then provide the end result to your user. So that's that's how I would say the, the Flask app could help you. Yeah. Okay, cool. Um, Alicia and Mia, you guys are also working together on something, right? Yeah. <laughs> Can you say something about it? You want to start it, Alicia? Uh, <laughs> so, um, Mia and I are, are very fortunate where we, we met at an event last year. And, yes. <laughs> uh, ended up being roomies and fast friends. So we've been talking over the last year about collaborating and uh, it's been great. Um, we've actually been um, accepted to to work on a publication with Manning, and uh, it's uh, AI using cognitive services. So we're we're both Microsoft AI MVPs, and we're we're very very happy to to work in the Microsoft stack, and we're very happy to to share that with everyone. And um, we're also collaborating with a, a few data MVPs. So yeah. we're working together with Matt Gordon, Ginger Gran, and Ida Bergen. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. So, uh, um, yeah, did you want to say more about the book? <laughs> you, you, you can give away all the secrets. I'm fine. <laughs> 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 Not really, but I would say it's like really interesting because like when you collaborate a book, you actually learn from each other, like mm -hmm. each of us has different personality and I also have different ways of writing. And then also we come from different backgrounds. Some people come from data and some people come from AI. So then you will see like how how we see the service that we actually see different solution behind it. So actually I'm so looking forward to like when I deliver something, people will give me some feedback and I'm also really interested to see how people are writing. And then I think it will definitely a really great uh, book later on we could bring to the market. Yeah. Cool. I'm looking forward to have a hard <laughs> copy of it or, or even a digital version is fine with me. <laughs> yeah. um, Mia, thank you very much for uh, joining us for uh, the fourth episode of the Global AI Community AI Talks. Yeah. Yeah. Um, next week, Thursday, we'll have another session. All right. So next week, Thursday, 7th of May. Is that next week? Should be a... Yeah, yeah, 7th May. Right. Um, we're hosting Danny de Klerk. Uh, Danny is from Belgium. He's uh, one of my buddies from here. Uh, he will be talking about AI for the better. Um, then he talks a lot about uh, accessibility um, and I'm really looking forward to his talk, how AI can help people with, uh, with disabilities. So forward really looking one. forward to that one. And, and sorry. So Alicia, sorry. Mia, so, Alicia thank you for joining Mia, me today. Thank you for joining uh, me today. Uh, nice to have a co-host. Nice to have a co-host. Nice to have another guest. Nice to have another guest. Mia, we hope we can uh, have you another Mia, we hope we can again. have you another time yeah. again. Uh, yeah. And then in the late, and one, then in, in the future, the we'll still have a lot of other people. Still have a lot of other people would like to talk to. So, yeah. well, people, this was the end for this episode.
thank you for joining and we hope we can see you next time again. Thank Bye. You. Bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you, Mia.